Android application development keeps on evolving. Since its first public release of Android 1.0 in 2008, up to its current version Android 11 in 2020, Google and the Android community consistently make significant improvement to the operating system and the tools used to develop Android apps. In this course, we will use Android Studio as Android's official integrated development environment built on JetBrains IntelliJ IDEA software. It is specifically designed for Android app development. You will learn from the scratch starting from Android Studio installation to building your very first Android app using Kotlin, the preferred programming language for Android app developers. Up to creating data-driven applications and publishing your app via Google Play Store. Hi, this is Joe Edgo and welcome to Android app development training course. For today's topic, you are going to learn how to install the latest version of Android Studio in your Windows environment. You are going to configure components using the Android SDK Manager, create Android virtual devices, and manage updates. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to run and test your first Android application using Kotlin programming language. To install Android Studio in Windows, let us go to developer.android.com studio and download the latest version of Android Studio for Windows. At the time of this recording, the latest version is 4.1.1. I'll accept the terms and condition and click download. The installer is about 900 megabytes and it will take about 3 to 5 minutes to download depending on your internet connection. Once done, you may run the installer and in the welcome screen, just click next to continue. In the choose components to install, Make sure to include Android Virtual Devices or AVD, aside from the Android Studio. The space required is about 2.7 GB. Then, click Next. You may want to change the installation folder location. I will accept the default and click Next. And then, click Install. Now, the installation process will take some time and you may want to click this Show Detail button if you want. And once done, just click Next. Then. Click Finish to complete the Android Studio setup. I'll choose not to import any settings and then click OK. You may want to send usage statistics to Google but I'll choose Don't Send. Then, the Android Studio Setup Wizard will appear. It will prompt you with the latest available beta version if you want to. I will ignore this update for the meantime. And then, I'll click Next. In the Install type, the standard option is the one recommended for most users but I'll choose Custom for you to see the available components and settings that you can customize. I'll accept the default JDK location and in the UI theme, you may choose Dark or Light, but I'll go with the light one. In the SDK setup, if this is the first time you install Android Studio, you have to select everything. Currently, the latest version of Android is Android 11 with API level 30. The Android Emulator Hypervisor Driver for AMD Processor is important to accelerate the Android Emulator. This option appears because I am currently using a computer with AMD Ryzen 7 processor. But if you are using an Intel processor, a different option will show up which is the Intel's Hardware Accelerated Execution Manager or HackSum. Make sure to install that one as well. The Android Virtual Device provides you with a virtual Android environment in which you can install and test your Android application. I'll click Next, and to install the Emulator Hypervisor Driver, just click Next. You may want to verify all the installation settings, and click Finish. And again, depending on the speed of your internet connection, downloading all the components could take some time. And once done, just click Finish. Finally, you'll see the welcome screen for the Android Studio version 4.1.1 where you can create a new project or open an existing project if you already have one. But for now, I am going to show you first how to configure your Android Software Development Kit or SDK. I'll click on the configure icon at the bottom right of this welcome screen and then click on the SDK manager. This launches the system setting, Android SDK window. And from here, you'll see three tabs, the SDK platform, the SDK tools, and the SDK update sites. In the SDK platforms tab, you will see all the available versions of Android SDK. The latest at the time of this recording is Android 11 or Android R. 
This is the name that most Android users recognize, like Oreo or Marshmallow. But on the developer's perspective, the API level is the one that you should be familiar with. As of now, I only have Android 11 or API level 30 installed on my machine. If you want to develop and test your application on a different API level like, for example, this Android 6, Marshmallow, or API level 23, just tick the checkbox adjacent to it and click apply. I will not do that for now since we can go back to this window anytime we want to install or uninstall an Android SDK platform. In the SDK Tools tab, you will see all the available developer tools. Make sure that the following are installed. The Android SDK Build Tools, the Android Emulator, the Android Emulator Hypervisor Driver for AMD if you are using an AMD processor. However, if you are using an Intel processor, make sure to install this Intel x86 Emulator Accelerator or Haxam Installer. Going back to the Android Studio's welcome screen, I'll click on the Configure and select AVD Manager. This opens the Android Virtual Device Manager. This AVD Manager allows you to create and manage all your Android virtual devices, which are required by the Android Emulator when you run and test your application. Currently, I only have one virtual device by default, the Google Pixel 3a with Android 11 system image. I can edit the configuration of this virtual device by clicking this small edit icon button. You can change the name, or if you want, you can change the Android virtual device currently being used. You can choose the virtual device you want to use from the available category of either phone, TV, Wear OS, tablet, and automotive. The current virtual device that I have right now is the Google Pixel 3a, but you can change it to any of these available virtual devices. One thing you might want to consider when selecting a device to emulate. The Play Store icon that appears next to the device indicates that this virtual device has a full support at the Google Play Store, which means you can use the emulator to log in using your own Google credentials and download apps directly from the Google Play Store on this virtual device. You can also change the system image. Currently, this device is using the Android R system image, but you can always download and use a different system image that you want your virtual device to run, like the Android Q, Android Pie, down to the older versions of Android. You can also show the advanced settings, and depending on the specifications of the computer you are using, you can configure whether this device uses a front and back camera. You can also set the number of processor cores and configure the memory and storage allocation. And lastly, make sure that the Enable Keyboard Layout checkbox is checked so that you can use your computer's physical keyboard instead of just the on-screen keyboard of your virtual device. Similarly, you can add multiple virtual devices by clicking this Create Virtual Device button, and you will be presented with a similar window that you have seen a while ago when we edit the Google Pixel 3a virtual device. If, for example, I want a Pixel 4 device definition, I'll click Next, and then I need to select the system image that I want. You have also seen this one where you can download or use the existing system image that you already have. I will not continue creating an additional virtual device, but instead, I'll use this default Pixel 3a. We can now launch this virtual device in the emulator by clicking the Run button under the Actions column. This may take a while for your virtual device to start up for the first time. And once it's ready, you can now connect the device to your Android Studio to launch and test your apps. I'll go back to my Android Studio and I will click Create New Project. In the project template that appears, you can choose either Phone and Tablet, Wear OS, Android TV, Automotive, and Android Things. Since the virtual device that I have is for the Android phone, I'll choose Phone and Tablet. You can select from any of the activities available. I can choose Basic Activity with a Navigation Component or an Empty Activity a full screen activity, Google Maps, login, and so on. For this, I'll choose Basic Activity and click Next. This is the name that will appear in the Android Launcher for this application. I'll change it to my first application and notice that the package name is also updated. Android follows the normal Java package convention by which it uses the reverse internet domain name to begin the package name. 
this uniquely identifies your application. Android also uses this in the path hierarchy on the storage media. So Android uses the package name to determine if the application has already been installed or not. I'll leave the default save location. In the programming language, you can either choose Java or Kotlin. You must understand that Android application framework is built around the Java Developer Kit or JDK. Java is the original programming language used to develop Android apps. But in 2017, Google announced the support for new programming language Kotlin from JetBrains as the first-class programming language of Android. Starting Android Studio 3.0, Kotlin has been included as an alternative to the standard Java compiler. And in May 2019, Google announced that Kotlin is now the preferred programming language for Android app developers. For this training course, we will use the Kotlin programming language to develop most of our test applications. Don't worry, you don't need to have any prior knowledge on Kotlin nor Java for you to learn this course. Although, prior knowledge on any object-oriented programming language will greatly help you to understand the course better. And finally, you need to set the minimum SDK that your application will be able to run on. By default, it is set to API Level 16 or Android Jelly Bean. When setting this, you have to balance between your target market and the features that will be included in your app. Selecting a minimum API Level of 16, for example, ensures that your application will run on approximately 99% of devices. The downside is that certain features will not be supported by most recent operating systems like Android R. However, selecting a minimum SDK of, say, Android 10, gets the most of the recent features of the latest OS in your app. But the downside is that you will also limit the devices that your application will run on. I'll set it back to API level 16 and click Finish. The first time you create an application, you might see that it takes a while for the application to be built. That's because Android Studio needs to download several components specified in your application's configuration. This could take several minutes, again, depending on the speed of your internet connection, as long as there are still messages being displayed here at the bottom portion of your IDE, the building process is still going on. When the Android project appears and you can see that this run button is already active, it means that your application is ready. So I'll click this run button and then I'll switch to my virtual device. Let's wait for the app to launch. And there you have it our first Android application in Kotlin. Let's explore our app. And as you can see, the toolbar displays the title of the application. It also has an overflow menu consisting of only one item, settings. We have not written any code yet, so when I click this one, nothing happens. There's a text in the middle of the screen that says, hello first fragment. And a button that says next. When I click this button next, the text disappears, and now the button says Previews, and when I click it, it goes back to the previous display. At the bottom of the screen, there is a fab or floating action button, and when I click it, it displays a snack bar with a message Replace with your own action. And congratulations, you have successfully launched and test your first Android app. Since Android Studio is updated frequently, Therefore, you need to know how to manage those updates. In the Android Studio welcome screen, you can click Configure and select Check for Updates. Updates in Android Studio is always optional, and at the time of this recording, a new version of Android Studio, version 4.2 beta is already available. Depending on your needs, you can manage the IDE and plugin updates by clicking this Configure Updates link, and this opens the Updates dialog window. And here, it is configured by default to automatically check updates for beta channel. You can always change this one. So what's the difference? The beta and dev channels have versions that are fully tested and are being prepared for stable release. However, the canary channel have all the latest features but it is not yet ready for stable release. So if you want to live on the edge or just want to explore and experiment the most recent features, you can try this one. For our next lesson, we will explore the Android Studio, manage the Kotlin plugins, start creating your Android application, and set up a physical device to run and test your app. Again, thanks for watching. 
If you learned something of value today, please click the like and subscribe button for more programming tutorials. This is Joe Edgo and hope to see you in the next video lecture.